um, first of all, like thank you to everybody who who, who is here now, like or yeah, who is here now. Uh, thanks for joining the meetup today. Um, so today is the the March uh March meetup lah. So I'll be going through like, okay. So so what's gonna happen today? Uh, actually we we will have one uh talk by Ted on event driven notifications in rails and after that we will um, be spending some time like just in a breakout room uh just to get to know each other just for 10 minutes just very quick one and and then uh, uh a short section if anybody has any job uh, shout out like want to hire or want to find job etc like both ways uh feel free to like say something then and then uh, we should, uh, if everything is on time, we, we should end uh, in one hour, 8.30. Okay. So, uh, so again, uh, shout out to Michael and Engineers SG. Thank you for hosting today's meetup. Uh, as usual, yeah, thank you for, yeah, for hosting us. Then uh, for those who don't know that we have a Telegram group, uh, recently there, there there has been some some people who has asked, who has been asking me like how to join apparently the the QR code on Ruby S3 is broken so like yeah this is the the QR code and to to, to join the uh, Ruby S3 telegram um so yeah um Ted are you ready we we can yeah let's 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 start with uh Ted's talk today okay let's see if i can share with you is it working yep i can see it okay excellent all right hello uh, my name is ted unless you haven't met me before. And today will really be a sort of case study of uh, how we have used event listeners to implement our uh, notification system in uh, Ruby on Rails. Before I start, I should say that I work for a company uh, named Ascenda. And in fact, I'm in our uh, office right now. And at Ascenda, we do a lot of Ruby. Uh, really, we have quite a few applications. Some are Rails, some are Hanami, some are pure Ruby. And we have one application that is written in Elixir as well. And we're more or less always hiring Ruby developers. So if you're interested in coming and working with us or even working on my team, then feel free to reach out to me on the Ruby SG Telegram chat, or uh, you can check out our website, ascendaloyalty.com, where you will also see uh, some of the job uh, descriptions there. All right. So I'm going to start uh, with some background uh, for what we're doing. And this will serve as sort of the why, the answer to the question why uh, for what I'm going to show you next. Uh, so what you need to know is the application that I am specifically working on is uh, a sort of orchestration app that uh, coordinates a lot of the work that is done by our other uh, Ruby applications. And it interfaces with uh, all the front ends and also it interfaces with our uh, partners and vendors through JSON APIs. Uh, so you can think of our whole ecosystem as sort of macro services. Uh, we have five or six 
Ruby applications that work together to uh, accomplish uh, what we do, which is uh, loyalty points related. And the application we're talking about today is sort of the hub in the middle of the wheel that does uh, a lot of orchestration of what's happening in the other apps. All right. One of the things that we do quite a bit of in this application is uh, send notifications to end users. End user uh, meaning that you are a customer of a bank or an airline and you are either earning points or you are spending points in uh, one of our marketplaces. So when you do that, we uh, will send you all sorts of notifications, sometimes by email, sometimes by SMS, uh, sometimes push notification. If you're using a banking app, for example, uh, sometimes through uh, some sort of widget. So this is a recurring task that uh, uh, sort of finds its way into most of the uh, workflows in this uh, orchestration application. So what we did initially was uh, we built a simple uh, notification system because we figured this is something that we'll, we're going to need to do uh, quite a bit. And one of the things we considered was uh, we don't want uh, any unexpected errors in the notification code to uh, break the flow for the user. Uh, because notifications aren't really that critical, and if the user was about to spend some points, uh, which translates to spend some money, uh, then we definitely don't want to prevent that from happening because our notification fails. So we built this simple notification system that has two steps, uh, a triggering of notification and then delivery of said notification. And if you wonder why one trigger will or could lead to multiple deliveries, it's because uh, we can deliver the same notification through any number of channels. So you could receive the notification both by email and push notification, uh, for example. So that's why the triggering of a notification might lead to multiple notifications being delivered. So looking at the first step of triggering the notification, what we do is uh, we create some notification records in the database. Uh, these records will have some uh, information like uh, which template uh, are we going to use, uh, which is the user we want to deliver it to, and uh, what is the data we need to populate the template. So our templates are uh, using liquid text as a, a templating language. So we interpolate some uh, data into there. And then the triggering of the notification schedules uh, some background jobs, any number of background jobs, depending on how many channels we want to deliver to. So here is a heavily uh, redacted version of the trigger notification class. And you can see notably that it takes in a user, an event, and some data. And for each channel, we try to create a notification record and schedule the job. And this trigger notification class does not contain any code that can unexpectedly fail. Uh, so this is quite safe. It fulfills our requirement of notifications not breaking things. So, so far, so good. Uh, 
Uh, this is how you would call trigger notification uh, from anywhere inside the application. Uh, so in this example, we are uh, triggering the checkout completed notification for a certain user. And take note of the third argument here, which is a hash. It's the hash named data. Uh, and note how we are uh, sort of digging into the transaction to pick out bits and pieces. And these bits and pieces are what will be interpolated into the template string uh, when we render the actual notification template. So in this example, I have actually taken out a lot of code so that uh, it's easier to digest. Uh, but this kind of data hash will normally have uh, something like six to, to seven keys. And the values uh, have some varying degree of complexity when it comes to picking them out of the uh, domain objects that we're dealing with. Uh, but remember this hash because it's a, it's a key to uh, what we'll be doing next. Then once we have triggered the notification, it will schedule some uh, background jobs. What these jobs will do is they will uh, render the templates and they will uh, try to deliver the notifications using the correct channel. So delivery could be uh, send a mail using our own Ascenda SMTP uh, system send a mail using the partner's system, uh, send a push notification through the partner's API, send an SMS through the partner's API. Uh, we have all sorts of channels uh, implemented here. And here is a redacted version of what the job looks like. So uh, we have some retry logic here uh, and other than that, it's fairly straightforward. We try to find the notification again, and uh, we have some deliver notification method, which uh, figures out how to deliver it based on the channel and tries to do that. So far, so good. Uh, we are quite happy with our little notification system. It's quite uh, flexible. It's easy to trigger notifications, and it's easy to add new notification templates. And because, of course, the delivery is done in background jobs, we don't really care if that fails or not, because it's not going to uh, error out the, uh, the whole application. Unfortunately, there was something that we didn't quite uh, foresee here. There is a hidden step almost. Uh, it turns out that a lot of times there's a lot of code involved in preparing the notification data that needs to be stored in the notification record in the database in order to eventually render the template for the notification. And this was sort of an uh, unforeseen thing. Uh, but it led us to the problem that we're trying to solve using uh, events. And this is that uh, any bugs in this code that uh, uh, sort of cherry picks data out of objects and formats it somehow and puts that into a hash will uh, basically blow up the application. Uh, which is really not good if the customer is trying to do a checkout, uh, i.e. they have committed to spending some points and we error out because of some notification uh, code issue. Uh, it's really bad because that notification, we could have gotten away with not sending it uh, really. And if we just error out uh, uncontrollably, then uh, this order is going to end up in some undefined state and it's going to require manual intervention to fix it, most likely. 
so I did some checking in our uh, existing order flows, and uh, it turns out that this type of code that uh, uh, just prepares the data for triggering the notification is usually somewhere uh, between a quarter and one third of the total length of code. So there is quite a substantial bit of the order flow that is just preparing data for notifications. And that means it's a pretty big uh, footprint for bugs as well. So another way to visualize it is uh, like this. Uh, we started out with our notification system in the green rectangle, which is uh, known to be safe. There can't be any errors in trigger notification. And if there are errors in deliver notification job, then that's fine. It can just retry itself until it uh, eventually fails permanently. But it turned out there was this hidden step uh, where we prepare the templates data that is uh, not safe. Uh, and it will cause exactly the kind of failure that we uh, try to avoid. And that kind of failure did happen uh, once or twice. So uh, I decided to try to fix that. Uh, so one of the solutions we came up with, uh, we considered a few of them, is to turn the service that needs to trigger the event into, or trigger a notification rather, uh, into an uh, event source or a subject, if you're looking at the uh, formal definition of the observer pattern. And then we let other parts of our code base uh, subscribe to this uh, service. And importantly, uh, any callbacks that are subscribed will uh, automatically handle errors in those callbacks. So the errors won't bubble up into the uh, main flow. Then what we hope to end up with uh, uh, is something like this. So on the right hand side, you see what we previously had. It's the notification system. But now we have some callback that has been registered with our, say, our checkout class. And that one is automatically error handled. It is uh, wrapped in an error handling wrapper when we register it, which we will see how it works uh, soon. And then the event source being any class that can trigger events, like a checkout class, uh, will call uh, all the callbacks that are registered with it uh, on some certain condition, like if it was successful or if it uh, uh, had an error. So this is uh, the state that we want to get to. So some of the pros of this solution is uh, it solves the original problem, which was one of uh, robustness. Uh, it turns out we can integrate this quite neatly with uh, some of our existing systems. Uh, a positive side effect is uh, it makes business logic code more focused. So it turns out that once you take out these 25 to 40% of code that do nothing but uh, cherry pick and format data for notifications out of like a checkout class, uh, that class becomes much more focused and it's a lot easier to see uh, what's actually going on with this uh, checkout. So it becomes a little bit less clear that it does send a notification, but at the same time, uh, we don't put all the nitty gritty details of sending that notifications uh, notification inside. Another nice thing is uh, because the registering of callbacks can be done from anywhere, basically, uh, we can organize the registration of those listeners in any way we want. So if we want to optimize the call base for uh, discoverability in some certain way, then we can uh, play around with how we 
put those pieces of code in our directories and files. And another nice side effect is we can actually use these events for uh, unrelated things, but that also should never make the application error out. Uh, so things like logging and instrumentation, like having this inside the checkout class is not really uh, critical. Actually, it's, it's detrimental. And uh, we also don't want errors in here to do anything bad to the actual uh, business logic. But of course, uh, everything is trade-offs, right? So it's important to consider the cons of this solution as well. Um, so the big one, which is like a general critique of the observer pattern, which is rather obvious, is that uh, the cause and the effect becomes uh, obscured here. Uh, if you look at the checkout class now, there is no notion whatsoever about uh, triggering notifications. So if you unwittingly just stumble on the code base and then you uh, are tasked with doing something notification related and you try to go into the checkout class to look for it, it won't be there. Uh, this is sort of a minor thing because we are using this for notifications across the board and we have a lot of them. So uh, you only need to learn once that, uh, okay, notifications are sent through uh, event callbacks and then you know where to look for them. And because of how we organize the files, you can also fussy search for notification and you will instantly find where uh, the notifications are being triggered. Uh, but yeah, this is the biggest downside. Like if you, if this is not such a cross cutting thing, if you are trying to fix a single point in your code, then uh, maybe you wouldn't go with uh, events. Maybe you would, you would go with something else. Uh, another con is errors inside the actual, uh, preparing of the template data will now get swallowed up, uh, unhandled. So it's actually harder to catch uh, errors in preparing notification data in uh, production. And I will go through in the uh, third part on enhancements, how we can fix this. Uh, there are also some Possibly possible issues with lazy loading. So uh, because you put the registering of the event callback in some arbitrary file, if that file is not loaded when you want the event or the notification to trigger, uh, nothing will happen because no, no callbacks have been uh, registered because the file hasn't been loaded. Uh, this isn't something I have experienced myself. It could theoretically happen in development if you have lazy loading enabled, but uh, uh, there are some ways to get around that, like Rails lets you uh, specify uh, directories to get eager loaded. So should be able to fix that relatively easy. Uh, but important to note, that uh, before you get super excited about using uh, events for something, just make sure that you have uh, the right problem to, to match it to. Okay, finally, before we go into the implementation, I uh, set some success criteria just for the heck of it. Uh, we want primarily the robustness to go up. And the way I will know this is I will never again see in app signal that a uh, checkout failed because we failed to prepare some uh, notification data. Uh, hopefully our confidence will go up overall. I think our confidence will go up when it comes to the critical parts, which is doing the actual uh, business logic. 
even if our confidence gets slightly lower in the uh, triggering of notifications, which I think is a fair trade-off. And ideally, we should see uh, no change or a little bit of an increase in productivity. Uh, there might be a tiny increase because we uh, uh, removed a lot of the noise in the relevant uh, business logic, but that might be offset by someone being confused by the whole event uh, listener concept. Okay, I think I'm done with the why and the what. So uh, part two will be the how. So this will show you some uh, diagrams and some Ruby code that will hopefully explain how this works. Uh, a lot of the code here is redacted, not because it's confidential, but because uh, uh, I don't want to overwhelm you with things that are unrelated to uh, the stuff I'm going to show. Uh, but it's actually not that far off uh, in terms of complexity. So I think you can uh, appreciate that it works anyway. OK, let's take a look at a typical, a typical checkout or order flow. The user wants to spend his hard-earned points on something. He goes to the front end to pick something from the marketplace. And then he decides to check out. This application that I'm working on will uh, receive the request from the front end. It will do a number of things depending on what you uh, order. Uh, a lot of checks are done before uh, we can carry on. And the way you can read this diagram is the uh, green arrow means that the step was successful and we can proceed to the next step. The red arrows uh, represent edge cases, which means that uh, there was an error in the checkout, uh, but it was not something exceptional. So we handled it uh, gracefully. Uh, this could include uh, you don't have enough points in your account to buy the thing. Uh, the thing went out of stock before you hit the checkout button and uh, all sorts of other things. Uh, if the checkout is successful, it, we move into the fulfillment phase, which means uh, we prepare to order this thing from the supplier. Uh, this is the simplest step. It basically just uh, runs a background job that uh, places the order with the supplier's API. And eventually, we will hear back from the supplier. And that usually happens through uh, a webhook. And in that webhook, they will tell us whether the order uh, was successful or not. So again, there are some uh, possibilities that we will uh, exit the flow unsuccessfully here. And when that happens, usually we trigger a bunch of other steps like uh, refunding uh, of your points and sending notifications. All right. This is how it used to work. Uh, this is where we call a trigger notification directly and the part of the code that prepares notification data uh, sits inside these services. So the checkout service has 25% of its code dedicated to uh, crunching this data. Fulfillment has 40%. Webhook processor has 35%. And all that code has the uh, chance of having a bug in it. Uh, with Ruby, it's usually the no method error. We try to access some attribute that uh, was nil. And so it will just explode. And this uh, order flow will be left in some weird state. 
and the front end will probably get some sort of unexpected error. So this is the old solution. You will see the familiar uh, trigger notification uh, method here. It's the same uh, piece of code that we looked at earlier, but out of context. Uh, so, and you can also see uh, some simple DSLs that we're using in this uh, checkout class, uh, like specifying the options, which are like keyword arguments, and also specifying uh, what result key will be there if this uh, service succeeds. So if you check the call method from top to bottom, you will see a guard cross there. And this is basically one of those red arrows that says, uh, if the price check fails, then uh, we will just uh, return the result of the price check, which will be an uh, error result. And the call site can handle that. If all the checks pass, we will schedule the fulfillment and we will trigger a notification. So this is one place where you could potentially end up with uh, the code failing because preparing of this hash, that is the third argument to trigger notification had some bad code in it. Instead, what we want to do is in the new solution, we want to emit an event. And instead of having all this cherry picked and uh, hyper formatted data uh, sent to the uh, callbacks, we will pick some bigger objects, uh, just the objects themselves. Uh, so in this example, you can see the trigger event is now gone from our call method. Uh, instead, we have a callback at the top that says just before we return success from this service, we will emit an event and its name will be success and its data will be a transaction. And this before success callback is evaluated in the context of uh, the instance. So that is how we can call a redemption transaction there and actually have it return uh, something that is uh, an instance method of this class. Right, so this uh, callback at the top before success, this is not part of the uh, event system. It is a feature of the, the code that lets you call success uh, at the bottom with some uh, result. That was there uh, before we even started this work. So what will happen when we call emit? Well, uh, the before success is called in the context of the instance. So we know it's an instance method and it's defined in the event source mixin. And it's a deceptively simple method. It just goes through a list of uh, registered uh, listeners. A listener is a callback wrapped in an error handle, handler. And one by one, it will uh, invoke them. Uh, so one thing to take note of here is this happens in the same uh, thread, in the same call stack synchronously. So even though you have this event system that can automatically swallow errors for you, uh, you should not put uh, some long running task in this uh, event listener. Uh, what you could do is you could have the event listener uh, schedule a background job. That would be a better uh, use of it. Uh, otherwise, your uh, main thread is going to end up spending a lot of time in here and the, the whole request is gonna take a lot longer than expected. 
which might be a bit hard to debug because uh, we don't, might not know what, exactly what listeners are there at the time. This is the implementation of the emit uh, instance method. Basically, we just uh, create a qualified event name. So it's prefixed with the name of the class, which for us will be the checkout class. And this is so that if you have the same event emitted from multiple classes, they won't be uh, confused with each other. Uh, we turn that into an event object. And then we uh, look at event listeners defined in um, event source. And event listeners is just a hash with a key, which is the event name, and uh, the value, which is a listener, which is a block wrapped in an error handler. So we look at all the event listeners for this event, and we just uh, call them with the event as the argument. Event is a very simple class. Uh, it's just a wrapper for the event name and the data. And we have some uh, open struct like uh, shortcuts so that you can, you don't have to type so much. And also, uh, instead of doing hash access that can silently return nil if the key doesn't exist, we uh, get proper errors if you call some uh, method on data that doesn't exist. Right, so we know how to trigger events. Now we need to register a, a listeners that can uh, be called when the event is triggered. And for that, we have a class method called on, and you just pass it uh, an event name, success, which you will uh, recognize from earlier when we uh, decided to emit the event success, and it will take a block. And the block will basically be whatever you want to happen when this event uh, is triggered. And here again, now you see the uh, trigger notification call. This used to be inside the checkout class. Now, instead, it is registered from outside. And you can really organize this any way you like. If you uh, notice here, you just need to reference the class and call on. Uh, in our case, we said, OK, let's uh, introduce this concept called notifiers, since it fits with how Rails uh, likes to classify things. And also, notifiers should make it pretty clear that this thing sends notifications down the line. Uh, and it works quite well with uh, fuzzy finding. If you type notify, you will find these uh, files, and you can figure out where notifications are sent. Uh, it also lets us organize the event listeners in neat ways. So uh, our order flows tend to have this checkout fulfillment uh, completion uh, three-step uh, approach. So what we do is we just put all the event listeners for the whole flow in one file. So then if you uh, want to answer the question, hey, what notifications do we send for uh, points transfers? Uh, then you can just look in that file and you can see, oh, on checkout, we send this. On fulfillment, we send that. And uh, if the thing uh, completes successfully, we will send this final email. But this could really be organized any way that uh, works for you. Uh, this is the implementation of the on class method, even simpler than the emit uh, method. It has the event name. It has an uh, optional keyword argument that allows you to override the uh, error handling. So in case you're debugging something, you can uh, register this with race errors true, and uh, it will 
help you by actually erasing the error instead of just silently failing. And of course, it takes the block, which is the actual callback. So the only thing we do is we wrap this block in a, a listener, and we push that listener onto the uh, event listener's hash, where the key is the name of this class plus the event name. And as mentioned earlier, a listener is just a block wrapped in error handling, basically. Uh, and this is how errors are not raised by default when you, uh, when you call emit and it executes all these uh, listeners. Uh, you can see that the error handling is in there. Unless you pass trace error is true, then it will raise an error. So if you look at the whole implementation of event source, it's only really the event listener's hash, which is omitted here, uh, and one class method on, and one instance method emit. And this is the whole uh, implementation of the event system right now. So uh, very simple code, very easy to understand, uh, but quite a powerful concept. Now, that was quite a deep dive into the implementation itself. Uh, so in this third part, I'll just talk about some uh, enhancements that I'm already working on. And these are addressing some of the shortcomings I mentioned earlier. And they're also uh, simplifying the use case for uh, our application. So one of the things I want to do is uh, for our particular service classes, uh, I might want to define some default event data that is always included and then allow the uh, addition of custom event data. So if you take a look at the checkout class that we uh, used this in earlier, you will see that the event data is the same as the data we return if the whole thing is successful. And it turns out this is not that incidental in maybe nine out of 10 cases, uh, the data we need for uh, the notification is the same as the data we uh, return in the success call. Uh, or at least it can be reached from that entry point. So uh, what I want to do is uh, instead of explicitly calling this uh, before success emit this, uh, I might just have the base class uh, do that uh, automatically. And the data will then be uh, whatever the data is for success. But in that one out of 10 cases where we need more data, then we need some way of specifying that, right? Uh, so then we will just add an event data method that you can pass some uh, symbols to, which will represent uh, instance uh, methods, or potentially we could uh, allow a block here as well. Uh, another nice thing about this is we can make it even safer in that uh, if this instance method is missing, for example, we could just uh, ignore that as well and have an even more robust uh, implementation. Okay, the next thing I want to do is uh, a configurable error handler. Uh, so I've already implemented this actually. Uh, and it addresses one of the problems I mentioned earlier that uh, because listeners just swallow their errors, uh, we wouldn't know if uh, the preparation of some notification has failed. Uh, so 
I just decided to add uh, the option to define your own error handler, which is just anything responding to call. So uh, in production, we can uh, report to app signal. And in development, we can just re-raise the error so that we can have it instantly debuggable. Uh, the last thing I want to do uh, is maybe a bit more uh, unobvious. So if we look again at our uh, checkout class, uh, we have this edge case, which is that if the price check fails, we return the result of the price check. This will not trigger a callback in the service. So uh, there's an error method that you can call if the error is uh, in this class. And that will invoke the before error callback, which means we can emit an event from that and uh, listen to it if we want to send notifications. Uh, but because this price check is its own service, uh, it is going to emit the event with that class name. So if we wanted to uh, listen to notifications from checkout, we would have to do it in a very indirect way where we uh, are actually register the event listener on the price check uh, service class, which is a bit uh, indirect and maybe uh, not immediately obvious. Uh, not to mention it would be really nice if we could just say uh, check out uh, before error emit this event, even if the error is coming from an uh, inside, inside service class. Yes, yeah, so those are the three uh, enhancements I'm currently uh, working on. And that's all I had for this presentation. I have no idea how long I've been going. So uh, I guess if there are any questions, we can take those now, if anyone is still here. I'm still in full screen mode, so I'm not, <laughs> not entirely sure. Anybody has any questions? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. I guess not. Then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I guess since Michael is here, if there are any, if there is anything you want to revisit, then there will be a video. Yes, there will be a video. There will be a recording. Um. Okay. Oh, there, there is a question by, uh, L three. Uh, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. While you are working on rebuilding this feature, what was your greatest challenge while using Ruby? Mm. That's an interesting question. Okay. The biggest challenge is making an informed decision where to put this um, event listeners data. So if you recall, the event listeners is a hash that has uh, keys that is a class name, uh, dot event name, and then it has an array of listeners. And then you need to ask, where does this hash go? Like, do I do a class instance variable in each of the service classes, or do I put like this one registry inside the uh, event source mixin or uh, or what and then it's very easy to get uh, uh, lost in the object model of ruby with uh, class instance variables and uh, singleton classes and and all that uh, so it it's relatively easy to do but it's hard to do in a 
a deliberate or informed way that you feel like you have made the, the right decision, if that makes sense. Hmm. Anybody has else have any questions? And I, I think um, we're good. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ted, for your sharing today. Thank you. Yeah. I,